Hi, and welcome back to Geology. I am Robert Lopez, and today I want to start off with geologic time, and especially this interlude E, which deals with fossil. Remember, fossils is Latin for something that's dug up, and it's really a remnant or a vestige of something that was once living, a living organism. And one of the first people to suggest that fossils were, were once living organisms buried by sediment was a Greek historian, Herodotus. Uh, and then later on, in the 1500s, Leonardo da Vinci speculated as to, well, why are these, why are there fossils in rocks? High up here on the mountain, I find these snails and clams. And he had an interesting quote. He said, well, somehow the mollusk knows the day of his death, and he crawls out of the ocean to die, to die up on the mountaintop. So it, it made no sense to him. He realized that these organisms lived in an ocean, died, were buried by sediment, and then later some tectonic activity or some upheaval, as he would say, uh, uh, would expose these rocks um, at higher elevations. Uh, and another important figure uh, is Nicholas, Nicolo Steno here. In the 1600s, he uh, proposed several geologic relationships that we still use today to, uh, to interpret the geologic past. And in fact, we'll talk more about Steno uh, in chapter 10 here. But uh, he argued that shells, teeth, bones could become part of the rock without losing distinctive shape. In other words, he could recognize that these were once living organisms. In fact, uh, Steno is famous for, um, for several reasons. Uh, uh, one was, uh, and what got him curious in geology, is he would, he would find fossil shells or shells up on the mountaintop and was curious as to how they formed and he actually wrote a geologic history of Florence uh, and because he was working in Florence for for um, an academy so back in these days uh, as a scientist you you really didn't have m much work other than to work for a wealthy duke and so he worked for a wealthy duke in Italy uh, at an academy uh, and mostly doing anatomy he was really known as an anatom anatomist. He would discover, uh, you know, ducts and, and glands and the brain and variety of parts. And um, in this area of Florence and also in the, on the Isle of Malta, in this part of Italy, they would, um, people would find these, these stones and they called them tongue stones. And they were very distinctive. They'd grind them up and sell them as medicine, uh, uh, you know, for vigor or, or, or for a ailing people. So it was, it was a business. But they were found all, found all over the sedimentary rocks in, in, in the hillsides. And then one day um, uh, in Florence, a fisherman had caught a great white shark. And they chopped the head off the shark and they sent the shark up to Steno because he was uh, the anatomist. And so uh, when he first opened the, the mouth of the shark and he looked inside, he saw these tongue stones, right? And so he realized right away all these tongue stones um, that people were were claiming were medicinal were really fossils of shark teeth, right? And that got him thinking about geology and the geologic history of Florence and how there were uh, um, uplifts or upheavals to expose these rocks, bring them out of the ocean. Now, as we continue on, uh, the next important person that your book talks about is Robert Hooke. And he realized that fossils represented extinct organisms, right? And um, extinction. So one of the important parts here is that uh, uh, there are species that lived on Earth and have gone extinct. And literally 99.9% .9 of all species that have lived on this planet are extinct, have gone extinct. So um, uh, that was an important uh, revelation. And then we talked about William Smith when we talked about uh, stratigraphy. And he basically realized that that different fossil assemblages occur in different strata, and you can use those fossil assemblages to determine the relative ages. A series of strata with dinosaur bones must be older than strata with lots of mammal bones, right? So he could, he, you can make out that distinction. And from that, uh, uh, we get the principle of fossil succession, which states that there's a systematic appearance and disappearance of species through time, and you can use those fossil assemblages to determine the relative age of the rock. And uh, animals die buried by sediment. There's a trackway, a burrow. There's some evidence of past life. Those are fossils. Uh, 
And so they're mostly going to occur in sedimentary rock. They may occur in pyroclastic rocks, uh, but you really don't find these in metamorphic or igneous rocks. And so there are several processes to uh, make a fossil. There's, you know, freezing and primarily permafrost, desiccation. There's amber here. I have some amber here. Amber is essentially tree sap, and, and especially insects can get caught in the tree sap. Um, this one doesn't really have any fossils in it, but it just shows that there's some amber. And then um, there's also tar, right? So like the tar pits in, in Los Angeles, La Brea tar pits, where animals can get engulfed and preserved in the tar. Uh, there's also recrystallization, where the bones, teeth, shells uh, uh, are replaced by other minerals, right? So a good example here is uh, this fossil uh, echinoid, which is a sand dollar. So sand dollars... Sand dollars and sea urchins are, are, belong to the phylum called Echinodermata, which means they have a spiny skin. So here's a, a more recent sand dollar, right? And so uh, what happens is the, 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 the organism is buried, the, 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 the sh original shell material is dissolved but leaves a cavity, or, or, or new minerals come in here and recrystallize into this. In fact, this is pyrite. This is a pyritized um, recrystallized uh, sand dollar, right? So that's one another way of getting a fossil. And then molds and casts. So the mold, remember, is the original material that's been weathered away, but you leave the hollow ca cavity, and then new sediment fills that cavity to make the cast. So think about um, uh, in the 79 AD eruption of Mount Vesuvius in, in Pompeii and Herculaneum, where there were all these holes in the volcanic classic material, well, people, uh, um, the archaeologists fill those holes with plaster, and so the, the holes would be the molds, but the plaster would be the cast. Then the other process here is carbonization, where organic material is sort of uh, 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 dissolved away, and what happens is just a carbon film is left, and a good example are these uh, graptolites. Graptolites are planktonic organisms that are primarily lived in the Ordovician and Silurian periods of the Paleozoic era. So they're really good index fossils. So whenever we find rocks with these graptolites, we know that we were looking at pretty old rocks that are about 400 million years old. These graptolites, but that's a, those are carbon films left, left behind. Permineralization would be where uh, minerals precipitate in the pore spaces. And so a common... Uh, permineralized fossil would be like fossilized wood, uh, uh, petrified wood, or it can make the mineral called chert. Now, there are trace fossils. Trace fossils are trackways, uh, burrows, footprints, um, and even fossil fossil dung. Here I have some, some 40 million year old fossil dung right here left behind by some, uh, some animal. So it's called a coprolite, right? So there's some fossil dung there. And um, I do have an example of a trackway here, a uh, trace fossil. So this is a trackway of a, a, an early dinosaur called Dilophosaurus. So this was left behind in, um, in a, a, a muddy, uh, muddy shale, maybe along some shoreline in a swampy area or coastline. And then we have the, the clear distinctive footprints left behind by this uh, Dilophosaurus uh, early dinosaur. And there are chemical fossils, which are biomarkers, and these are, are, are you know, they involve a little bit more laboratory work and more detailed study, but a good example is looking at the carbon isotopes. So remember, uh, uh, iso means the same, the same, and tope here will mean type. So all three of these atoms are carbon atoms. They just vary slightly in their atomic masses. There's carbon 12, 13, and 14, right? When we do geologic uh, time in terms of uh, absolute radiometric dating, we'll learn more about these isotopes. Uh, but one thing we look at is, is uh, the ratio between carbon-13 and carbon-12. And so uh, uh, in science, we call that a fractionation. So some chemical system, or in this case an organic system, prefers one isotope to the other. For example, plants or algae or, any, or, or anything that does photosynthesis. So PSN is my abbreviation for photosynthesis. So plants, algae, uh, uh, cyanobacteria, 
that 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 do photosynthesis, they prefer the carbon twelve, right? So that means um, if you find graphite, so graphite is a um, is a mineral com composed of entirely carbon, right? And so some graphite in the fossil record seems to have a depletion in carbon-13 or low values of carbon-13, which means, which is interpreted by scientists to being that, that um, uh, some organism must have produced that carbon residue, that, that graphite, uh, which, which means it's, it's, it indicates an evidence for life, right? And so we find rocks that are, or at least carbon, carbonized uh, remnants in, in some metamorphic rocks that uh, date from about 3.7 to 4.1 billion years old. And that graphite shows a depletion in carbon-13, which means it might be a chemical signature for the earliest life on Earth, right? So um, that's how, that's, you know, we really don't see the first fossils till about 3.5 billion years ago. In fact, um, uh, this GA term is for, uh, is really for giga years. And giga years is one times 10 to the nine years. So if you think about that, one times 10 to the nine, that's a billion. So we're looking at 3.5 billion years for some of the first fossils. And those are called stromatolites. Uh, but we can go back to about 4 billion years for some of the first evidence of chemical life, right? In these, um, in these carbon signatures or biomarkers. Another big field that's really uh, uh, been important, especially for more recent uh, um, calculations in terms of when the last ice age and when the climate started getting warmer uh, and those are the microfossils. They're, they're too small to see with a naked eye but we're, uh, we use microscopes and in fact a really important one is pollen and then uh, a plankton in the ocean, right? So plankton in the ocean and pollen here in terrestrial settings. Um, uh, that's for the microfossils. Uh, remember the macrofossils are going to be the the larger, right? So this plankton and pollen go with the microfossils here, but these are the larger body fossils are the the, the macrofossils, right? The microfossils will be the plankton, algae, pollen, and even bacteria, right? You know, fossils it's really hard, very difficult, and the fact that we're finding them is 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 really quite amazing, and we still haven't found. I mean, there's there are far more because geologists have not looked everywhere yet. There's some places we haven't even been able to reach. But the fossilization is really the exception rather than the rule because it's difficult to form a fossil. And, and really you need three special circumstances. The first one, you need a, an anoxic environment. And anoxic means low oxygen or no oxygen actually. And so in these oxygen poor environments, this allows for the slow decay and gradual burial of the organism. So you have slower oxidation rates, there are few to no scavengers, so the material, the bones won't get scattered, the shells won't get broken up, and you're going to have a, a slow bacteria action, right? So they're going to decompose it in a very slow process, which, which can lead to really good fossilization. And then this rapid burial is another circumstance where uh, uh, the, the, the fossil will be buried, the organism will be buried before scavengers or oxidizing agents uh, uh, or some sort of rotting occurs. So you get this quick burial. And then finally, the third one is hard body parts. If it has a hard body part, a shell, uh, it has a better chance of being preserved than if it's a soft-bodied organism. And, and really, uh, what, we've, what we'll talk later, later about, there's this, there's this time called the, the Cambrian. In fact, it's called the Cambrian Explosion. It's really more of a of a radiation of life where we see many, many different species in the fossil record suddenly at an, at an important boundary, the Cambrian period, which is the first period of the Paleozoic era. And really what happened in this Cambrian period is that life developed shells. And so, um, because we find now with more sophisticated technology, we find plenty of fossils before the Cambrian in this time called the Proterozoic Eon. And in this time, these fossils are all soft-bodied, so they're hard to preserve, but we are finding them. We find that they were quite diverse, um, but they were mostly soft-bodied.